actually asked to give this webinar um, on a subject that's been a lot of fun and has produced a lot of you know amazing visuals. So um, I'll um, keep going and I'll, I'll talk about a, a few things. Um, so I've got a brief outline of what the presentation will, um, will show, um, sort of giving a background on using drones for monitoring coastal ecosystems, um, enhancing their potential with um, advanced sensor mounting, and then a, a, a look at the case study of uh, examining the impacts of the Kaikoura earthquakes. So drones for monitoring. Um, I'm usually at pains to point out to people that um, aerial imaging is, is hardly new and um, while I don't really want to go into a history of aerial imaging because it inevitably leads us to wartime um, technologies, um, it's really vital that we see that there's been a, a long history of, of aerial images um, from a range of platforms and um, examples that I've put on here are from um, out of Marlborough Sounds where the Marlborough District Council has done aerial surveys since uh, 1958 um, and through to 2018, where they've um, done manned aircraft surveys of very large areas. And these images can be used quite effectively to um, manually identify um, marine features, and in this case, um, macrocystis or giant kelp populations. Um, and so if you're squinting trying to find anything in the in the top right image of Ship Cove in 2018, um, stop straining because there is no kelp left um, at this site, um, largely um, through a range of factors, but from, but from what we've observed, um, grazing of sea urchins um, and potentially heat wave events as well. Um, so the, the, some of the issues with aerial imagery is that it's often not, um, it's not collected just for marine sampling. It's usually co collected for a range of purposes and so it's not particularly well optimised for that um, purpose but um, luckily enough the, the characteristics that you need to fly manned aircraft also kind of suit a lot of these uh, a lot of the um, uses for marine ecologists as well. Um, they need clear skies basically and if, if possible clear sea conditions so um, sometimes these flights while, make, while not um, optimised for marine sampling can actually produce very good results and can be used quite effectively for mapping um, coastal ecosystems or at least um, biogenic habitats. Um, so these examples are some targeted um, aerial surveys of the Otago coastline. Um, so these um, manned aerial aircraft flights were done specifically to sample giant kelp um, macrocystis over a very large stretch of coastline, um, something like 30 kilometres. And so these flights were timed to um, coincide with maximum coverage of the kelp, um, as well as a, a range of <coughs> environmental parameters, um, clear skies, um, where possible calm wave conditions, um, and clear water, um, as well as being low tide as well. Um, but it's quite clear on the very right hand image that it's not always possible to get this right. And, you can see that on this day here, there's quite a lot of sediment resuspension, um, and this affects the visibility of the kelp through the water column. So the other dominant type of remote sensing or aerial imagery that we have access to is um, satellite imagery. And um, these sensors do really frequent passes over um, coastal and, and coastal ecosystems, whole oceans and land. And, um, while they're a lower resolution of pixels than these other methods, they do have the benefit of being um, multi-band images. Um, so many satellites are equipped with um, multi-band imaging systems that have both the visible wavelengths as well as infrared, near infrared, and they include both broad and narrow bands as well. So um, a, a lot of these have been um, optimised for a range of different purposes. Um, such as being able to tease out things like cloud cover, um, atmospheric aerosols, um, as well as get some physical features from the environment as well. And while they might not have been optimised for the range of purposes that they're currently used for, there's been a large amount of spin-offs that have come from this information that have been 
um, have really advanced a lot of remote sensing of uh, marine environments. Um, so the imagery on the, the left hand side shows um, some, <clears throat> some examples of what these multi wideband images look like. So we have the, the typical RGB image at the top, red, blue, green. Uh, and then if we insert one of the near infrared bands, you can see vegetation comes out a lot clearer. Um, and with these near infrared bands, you can also develop um, vegetation health and indices. So um, these, these products are, are really useful for a range of different purposes. And um, while they're low resolution, if the frequency of passes is um, really beneficial to a range of purposes. So now to the, the subject of the talk, really, and um, essentially rise of the drones. And um, I, I'm aware that this video may not look good to those of you watching online or even on this screen here, but um, it's, it's a little clip that Dave Allen um, put together just showing some of the work we were doing in Kaikoura. Um, but what I really want to point out here um, and backing up those last few slides is that each of these um, aerial imaging methods has its pros and cons. Um, so while um, you get very frequent passes of satellites over the whole Earth, um, the pixel resolution is very low and we have no control over the timing of those passes to coincide with um, specific events or timing of that, timings that may be um, useful for our sampling purposes. And then manned um, fixed wing aircraft kind of fit in between drones and satellites. Um, but the, the real key, um, the key advantages of drones are the extremely high pixel resolution, and this only goes up um, the lower you fly it to the ground. Um, but there's a trade off with the, the cost of covering area when you do this. So um, the greater the area you want to cover, essentially the higher you have to fly it and the lower your pixel resolution. Um, so there's important things that need to be recognised in terms of what zone you're hoping to cover and what resolution you, you want to get. Um, the other key benefit is the flexibility of use. Um, it's compared to the other methods, it's rel relatively simple to time your drone flights to get a specific set of characteristics relating to weather or um, even targeting specific events. So just to um, talk about high pixel resolution, because this is really the key benefit that you get from um, aerial drones. Um, it allows a few things, um, in particular for once we talk about vegetation or in this case, um, targeting coastal um, ecosystems, um, being able to have really high pixel resolution means that we can essentially develop species level um, classification algorithms, automated classification. Um, this is really quite obvious when you look at a reef like this one, which is Oaro Reef, where you have a real mosaic of macroalgal um, kelp diversity, and there's def definite patches of different species of different colours and um, different forms. So without the high resolution, you wouldn't be able to use object-based object classification procedures because most of your objects would essentially fall over two fewer pixels to define their shape. Um, the other side of it is because of the mosaic type structure, um, you're able to really um, spatially define um, the different patches, the different patchiness. And this reef in particular is one of the most diverse um, macroalgal beds in the country. And well over 200 species have been identified from, from this area. And even from this image, you can see that there's quite a, a number of different habitat patches, even from, from the scale. So once you drill into that at the small scale, the diversity is really quite striking. Um, yeah, so the, the real key um, point that I'm trying to drive home is that when you're trying to look at diversity met metrics or um, understand spatial distribution of quite mosaic communities, then high pixel resolution is a, a real benefit to being able to automate these procedures um, and move away from manual um, identification. So alongside the strength, strengths of drones, there's also a range of limitations, clearly. Um, 
when we move away from intertidal zones and start to look into the water column, um, there's a real influence of water clarity and turbidity. Um, once, we, once turbidity rises, the level of differentiation between biogenic habitats goes down. Um, so the spectral signal gets dampened by the water column and this is um, further affected by increasing turbidity. Um, and the same with being able to just see the benthos, um, see the bottom um, with increasing turbidity and increasing depth. So being able to map at the species level also requires low elevation flights, um, which has the effect of making flight paths really long. Um, and this has a, a really major effect on the area that you can cover in a given amount of time. Um, while this may not be a huge issue for terrestrial researchers, when you're really targeting low tides, this becomes really, really key. Um, so a good idea of what you want to cover um, at an amount of time and what level of um, pixel resolution you need becomes really critical. Um, the other aspect is um, low ambient light intensity can affect a couple of things. Um, it affects the speed that, with which you can fly the drones. So the lower the light intensity, the slower the drone has to go to avoid blur um, and avoid getting um, your automatic settings of your cameras increasing the ISO, ISO which um, increases the graininess of the images. Um, so big, big effects on the, the crispness of the images, um, but also the distinctness of the spectral return. So the less light you've got going in, the, the weaker the spectral signal is coming out. Um, so really targeting specific weather conditions starts to become quite key to getting the, the optimal products. And just to give you an example of what good and bad looks like, um, there's, there's a few, once you start to miss the right conditions, you start to see why it matters so much. Um, so top and bottom of these two um, headlands, there's uh, up the top is 2018, um, where we managed to hit these headlands in relatively low swell conditions, um, good clear, um, clear sunny days and relatively clear water column. Um, Below in 2019, um, just recently, the swell was a lot bigger than we would have hoped um, while we were capturing these headlands. And you can see that the, the influence of these of waves and breaking waves is massive. Um, the foam that they produce and the movement of the waves through frames means that the image stitching becomes really compromised and um, as well as being able to observe through the water column. So you can see that there's parts of subtitle reefs in the top images that are obscured in the, in the bottom ones. Um, for the same reason, you get blurring of your um, species of interest. Um, in this case, um, Davilia or the bull kelp species, which are really um, thrown about by the waves, start getting um, blurred in movement. But also um, between frames, they can kind of get lost as well. So um, there's a really massive influence of you know, um, of wave, what breaking waves and surge. And it, this makes um, using your automated algorithms for classification near impossible. Um, it was possible, in this case, you can see um, some red polygons which have been manually identified of um, bull kelp species. But if both sets of imagery were really clear, then um, automated algorithms would have been possible and multiple habitat layers might have been um, distinguished through their spectral signals rather than just visibly manually identified. So this video here isn't to make you feel seasick, it's um, just to point out how challenging these coastlines are. Um, this is um, Tyra Head on the Otago Peninsula and trying to access um, the rocky intertidal from land or even from sea is incredibly challenging and in this case basically impossible from land anyway so um, in this in that wee clip you know it might not have looked too surgy or too bad but I guarantee you none of us would have gotten the water to sample those reefs that day and it was you know it seemed a pretty nice day um, from the outset but you know wave surge is a, is a real 
um, it really stops us from being able to sample these environments at well. And even under good conditions, um, my colleagues would, would tell you that it's challenging and might even um, hurt me for making them do shitty jobs. Um, so, you know, these, these reefs are um, really exposed, they're turbid, um, they're difficult to access from land and sea, and they're also impacted by a range of um, physical variable, uh, sorry, um, climate change variables, heat wave events and changing storm dynamics. Um, also land-based land shifts, um, sedimentation and eutrophication um, really have influences on these reefs. So um, for effective management interventions or um, just being able to understand where and, and how these reefs are being impacted, um, we need to understand, uh, we need to have a, a broader scale understanding of where they're being impacted um, and, for example, if they are being impacted. Uh, and drones potentially fill this niche. Um, like I've said, the ability to physically in situ sample these, these reefs is really challenging. Um, and validation will always be required, but um, if we can extrapolate these in situ validation sampling campaigns with broader scale um, measurements, then um, it gives us a far better understanding of um, broader scale impacts. And so the, the jobs that drones are probably best suited towards are um, really discrete areas. Um, in this case, um, discrete headlands of rocky reef become really ideal targets for, for drone-based imagery. Um, while it would be possible to do manned aerial aircraft flyovers of these headlands, they're pretty small. Um, so you would kind of be capturing them in one or two photos, um, in most cases from an aerial aircraft, uh, a manned aircraft, um, whereas we can really sample quite, um, quite intensively using drones and use this to get really high resolution, but also um, use photogrammetry to do 3D reconstruction of the shape um, and um, the, some of the physical features of the rocky reef as well. Um, and so these three headlands were um, surveyed for Port Otago um, and we're running a, a monitoring campaign down there to examine long-term changes associated with dredging um, of the Otago Harbour. And so using drones to have a look at these areas as a whole is a, a really powerful way of seeing any potential changes. Um, and when we're able to get good imagery, potentially we can separate out um, a range of different species as well as um, total cover. So the next part of the talk is looking to enhance some of the products we get from um, aerial drones. So I think for me this is where drones really come into their own and where the real um, real interest and real um, application of them is going to um, be telling for development of coastal marine science. Um, so this image here um, is a multi-spectral image of Awara Reef in Kaikoura uh, and you can I know I realise that it's in a strange colour suite, and that's something that you get from multi-spectral images, and that they're taken from a range of bands that um, may not be, you know, inside and outside of the visible spectrum. And so, using in this case, using some of those um, near infrared spectrum, you get quite a, a red tinge to everything. Um, but it's really, it's the ideal wavelength to detect vegetation. It, it essentially shows um, the photosynthetic, um, some of the photosynthetic potential going on. And these are the wavelengths that get used for um, vegetation indices. Um, but the other thing that's really critical to point out is that we can only ever visualize in any, in any image three bands of, of spectra. So you know, red, blue, green, or in this case, near it for red, red and blue. Um, but there's, in this case, there's another three bands of information that we can't see. And that's what really, that's where being able to um, automate classification um, algorithms, that's where they really um, use all of those six bands and get information that we can't detect with our own eyes. Um, 
so multispectral sensors are really um, have been developed mainly for agriculture um, where they can detect the vegetation health um, detect pests and and find ways of, of, of treating that or you know targeting plants that have gone bad and things like that um, but their, their application for the marine coastal environment is potentially really great um, and then there's hyperspectral sensors which not only don't just have six bands but they can have a hundred bands and admittedly they take data in quite a different fashion and there's um, hopefully going to be some work to try and um, see what we can do with them either to um, optimize multispectral sensors or to um, or to use the hyperspectral as the, the, the sensor of choice and um, Hamish Biggs here at Niwa Christchurch has been developing um, hyperspectral sensors for a range of purposes and um, hopefully we can look at some of that some crossover there. Um, other types of um, advanced sensor payloads that we can put on drones uh, are LiDAR and in this case we've got a um, LiDAR mapping another reef in Kaikoura which is um, Waipapa which is probably the, the more iconic um, uplift location and you can see kind of down the centre of that image um, the, the real um, rift that has occurred along there where you've got quite different levels of uplift on each side of that wall. Um, but thermal imagery as well, um, thermal imaging cameras are being used on drones more and more as well. Um, and in this case, it's another shot of OARO towards the end of a sampling campaign um, just to test the usefulness and potentially a, a useful product for examining thermal stress um, in marine coastal ecosystems. <coughs> so just to go a little bit more into the, the spectral side of things, um, we've got a four images here ranging from um, RGB which is, is what we see, um, multispectral which is, is quite difficult to, to make out. Um, so the RGB, these images are three broad bands um, and these bands are quite, uh, you know, they're, they're broad, they're not only broad but they're overlapping. So the red, the blue, the green have some overlap with each other and this means that getting a really discrete signal out of them can be challenging. Um, but they're not optimised for what, we're, what I'm essentially trying to do here. They're optimised for aesthetics to, to approximate what we see. Um, whereas the multispectral you can see is, you know, it's one that's hard to see. Um, and that's because when you start looking at really narrow bands, the amount of light you're receiving is really low. So you've narrowed that, that sensing band down so much that the return amount of light is, is really small. Um, but it potentially has more use when you've targeted very specific colours or um, specific spectra. Um, and then we have a composite image, which is overlaid um, composite image of the three broad bands of RGB and the six narrow bands of multispectral. And so this is really, um, really valuable because it gives us the high pixel resolution of RGB um, with the high spectral resolution of multispectral cameras. And when we use this for classification, we get um, improvements in the accuracy of these classification procedures. Um, and again, the composite imagery is even more difficult to visualise because you can overlay a high pixel resolution of an RGB layer um, or band with um, some of the lower resolution um, multispectral bands. And that's where you start to see that the pink bits of this image, which are essentially one of the um, near infrared bands that shows you um, the vegetation health um, or at least photosynthetic potential. And so then we can um, put in a bunch of training samples and classify whole areas. And that's what this classified layer is here. Um, so I've done a few comparisons of the relative accuracy of um, of each of these products alone. Um, so we've got three different um, ways of randomising points across um, across the whole image. Um, so they're the stratified random, equalised stratified random and random point allocation. And this is just a, a, a different way of um, allocating the points, whether you put them all into um, randomly across the whole image 
or whether you make sure that you get some in some of the smaller classes. So for example, the, some of the um, algal species might only cover a really small area. Um, and to get some points to make sure you're looking at that layer, you would use um, a stratified random or equalized stratified random um, point allocation. Um, so a value of zero is zero accuracy, everything was wrong. Um, a value of one is everything was perfect. So um, the RGB um, images alone, we see about a 70% accuracy of habitat classification. Um, when we segment those images, so when we group pixels that are really similar quality, um, we get a slight improvement on RGB. Um, but we see a big change when we use multispectral imagery. Um, and this is really clear um, from the lack of black uh, in these images. So um, the black is essentially a class that I've designated as shadow, as in something that I can't identify. Um, and when I, run, when I run the algorithms across RGB, a lot comes up as black. And that's essentially because the spectral signal out of this imagery isn't enough for the uh, um, imagery to distinguish um, some seaweed from um, shadow. But you can see in the multispectral image on the right that a lot of this black has kind of disappeared. And that's because these, um, especially these near infrared layers um, and some of the real specific narrow bands really pinpoint vegetation over some of our null habitat features, um, such as rock or shadow. Um, and when we add these together, these RGB and multispectral data sets, the accuracy goes up again. So these um, composite um, high information data sets really provide us with far greater accuracy again. So um, continuous improvement with more information, which is um, pretty expected. Um, so another potential application of multispectral imagery, or at least another benefit is um, the ability to do vegetation health indices. Um, so you can see in the, the multi-spec image um, in the middle here that um, these beds of pyropia, um, formerly porphyra, this um, sushi seaweed species, stand out really strong on these rocks. Um, and when we have a look at the vegetation health ind indices, NDVI, um, you can kind of see some of these beds, but what becomes clear as well is that um, they're not as photosynthetically active as the seaweeds in the water, which is coming out as bright white. So um, this can kind of tell us um, some other aspects of, of vegetation health and potentially as applications in um, defining if impacts of heatwave events or pollution or nutrient stress and um, perhaps a range of applications for um, drone-based vegetation health indices. So an area that um, potentially we can see some movement in. Uh, and just to sort of sum up the, the potential for drones, um, I think there's some really neat developments going on. Um, Matt Pinkerton and Mark Gall from Niwa and Wellington have been developing um, the use of drones and multispectral and hyperspectral sampling to come up with um, water quality measures. So water column-based um, metrics for a range of parameters. Um, and funnily enough, they happen to be um, working with the same sorts of sensors that are really useful for habitat mapping as well. So there's the real potential to um, optimise a range of spectral sensors for sort of simultaneous product capture and making most of, um, mo well, for example, hitting the right weather conditions is, is challenging. So getting multiple products from a single flight is, is really beneficial. Um, so onto the, some of the Kaikoura imagery, and perhaps this is what many people have been really interested to see, and it's certainly been the area that we've developed um, a, lot of this, a lot of this data. Um, so as, I'm sure you're all aware the Kaikoura earthquakes in um, 2016 massively uplifted rocky reef ecosystems and um, one of the worst affected species was kelp um, and in this example bull kelp. Um, it's worth pointing out that 
while Davilia Poha Antarctica is a low intertidal uh, uh, um, subtidal species. This is mainly Davilia willana, um, which is essentially a subtidal species. And it is, at this site, it was pushed right out of the water. And while there's a few surviving plants, which I'll show you later, um, it has been, you know, it's a huge uplift to take a subtidal plant clear out of the water. So um, really drastic changes. And so we've mapped a range of sites along the Kaikoura coast, um, ranging from six metres uplift down to no uplift at all. Uh, so down at the um, bottom left end, uh, Oara Reef, which had very little change at all in, in elevation, up to Waipapa Reef uh, towards the, the north, uh, towards the top right of that map. Uh, so that had six metres uplift. Um, but interestingly, just next to it, um, on the other side of the fault, we're looking at three metres uplift. So there's a very strong distinction, um, which allows us to have a look at some of the changes that have happened within the same sort of eco zone. Uh, and then we have a range, a, a range of intermediate uplifts as well that we've had a look at. Uh, but just for brevity, we have, I've got a site with zero metre, um, one metre, two metre, and six metre uplift that I'll show you full drone images of. So this is Oara Reef and uh, this has always been a site that's kind of been fascinating and just fantastic to visit. Um, but my appreciation for it has only gone up with the aerial images. It's just, it's the kind of, it's the kind of image that I find myself just staring at sometimes. It's got some amazing geological features alongside the ecological features and you can see this folded limestone um, platform towards the top left of that image um, that's been across a few of the images and it's just a feature that I've looked at on the ground and never realised how how incredible it looks. It's, it's clearly a, an area that is, you know, driven by earthquakes and, and massive geological events. So um, it's just been a, a real eye-opening experience to look at these things from the air. Um, but the other thing about the geology of this site is that it's, it's kind of produced some protecting features to this reef. So you've got these platforms that are um, kind of lifted up towards the seaward edge, and it's meant that a lot of the, the intertidal zones been protected from the major swells that hit this area. So um, it's partly um, part of the reason why it's such a diverse uh, habitat. Uh, so, Zooming in to have a look at the site, um, you can see these features um, like this folded limestone platform and some of these rocky reef um, raised rocky platforms. Um, but when we have a look at the, um, the classified habitat layer, it becomes really clear that this is almost completely covered in macroalgal seaweed species and kelps. Um, all of the pink that you see is coralline algae, which um, as I go through, you'll see is pretty low in coverage as we go into uplifted sites. Uh, and the, the golden colour is um, the bull kelps as well, which again have been pretty severely impacted at other sites. But at this location you can see that there's a, a lot of these, um, a lot of this habitat um, alongside some of the more ephemeral species like the olva and green. Um, and then in the, the dark brown um, we have essentially vegetation layers that we can't differentiate between species, but we can tell the difference between them and the water column. So Wairipo Reef, um, this site was uplifted by 70 centimetres to a metre, and it's been really heavily impacted in the intertidal. And this is a location where I was lucky enough to do my PhD research and see the, the coverage of um, Hormosaira or Neptune's necklace, which was almost 100% you know, cover of this reef and very high density, very high biomass. Um, but now um, seasonally it's covered by ephemeral species such as Olva and Pyropia, which uh, come and go through certain seasons and largely burn off um, during the summer months. So really dramatic changes to the intertidal um, but in terms of the subtitle environment, 
Uh, you can see that there's still quite high density, high coverage of some of the subtitle species, uh, in this case, carpophyllum. So, Omihi Reef, this is where uh, this image is from. So, this was a 2 to 2.5 metre uplift site and really dramatic impacts to this reef. Um, this is one of the few places that I was actually able to visit really shortly after the earthquake. So, um, seeing everything that was there um, kind of on its way out. Uh, so, a lot of this image here would have been within at least the intertidal zone and much of it in the subtitle. And so this has had quite big consequences on the, the amount of kelp um, and seaweed species that are, are remaining. So this is a classified image of that area. Uh, you can see uh, I've, there's this generalised class that's covering a lot of the subtitle zone, which is kind of a, a gap filler. Um, we can tell that it's a seaweed or a vegetation, but we can't exactly tell what species it is. And then in between, we have a few different classes. So there's a little bit of golden that you can see, and that's Davilia willana, uh, but no, none of the Antarctica or Poha um, have been observed at this site. So um, very big impacts of the earthquake um, at this level of uplift. Um, and as you can see along the intertidal fringe, quite a high cover of ulva uh, of the ephemeral species. Uh, and as we move into that wave surge zone towards the bottom right of that figure, you can see that there's a little bit of the coralline class um, as well as some red algae as well. Um, so last but not least, this is uh, Waipapa Reef, which was uh, the, the really iconic uplift site. Um, so this essentially had six metres of uplift from the, from the earthquake. And you can see on this platform here that a lot of this rock is, you know, really grey. It doesn't even have any of the burnt off coralline, which comes up as, as a white image. Maybe towards the bottom left, um, you can see that. Um, so it's clear once you're walking around out here that this, this reef prior to the earthquake didn't have any biogenic habitat on it. It was probably um, underneath these gravel um, gravel beds. So it's essentially new rock that's been thrust up um, out of the gravel zone um, and has had nothing, not even had anything to that, um, that died on it. Um, and so this is the site that we've had a, a look at the LIDAR and um, hopefully with um, future surveys we'll be able to see some of the sediment dynamics going on here because it's very clear that this reef is still eroding and going on un uh, undergoing dramatic changes um, as it's as it's been exposed to the air so we suspect that um, through time we'll see a lot of this a lot of this rock eroding very very fast um, so in terms of the biogenic habitats that are there at the moment um, it's really, really quite phenomenal because we, we don't have any, any brown species, essentially. There's a few um, small numbers of brown algal recruits starting to make their way onto the site. Um, but largely, we're looking at the ephemeral greens and red algal species that are dominating this platform. Uh, and the uplift was so great that a lot of the, well, all of the subtitled brown algal species um, essentially haven't survived the uplift. So they were inhabiting to a certain depth and beyond that depth, they were unable to survive, presumably because of the, the light environment. Um, but the uplift has pushed that whole um, range, that whole depth range of species um, into, into the air essentially. And um, the, only, the only seaweed that we're seeing now uh, sorry, the only canopy forming brown seaweed uh, recruits that are coming in fresh. So how will the, this drone imagery help uh, management of these large impacts that we've had from the earthquakes? Um, well, essentially what we're attempting to do is relate the level of um, vertical uplift to ecosystem health. Um, and in a, a broad sweeping approach, we can, we can um, categorise these as different levels of, of health. 
um, for example, areas that are relatively pristine, um, areas that are potentially on, a, on essentially a knife edge where they may be vulnerable to further changes um, associated with, for example, um, heat wave events and areas that clearly have a long road ahead of them um, that are still undergoing dramatic changes because of erosion um, and um, are unlikely to see noticeable improvement um, in the short term. So if we have a look at the, these side by side in the um, classified layers, you can see some of the dramatic differences that you have in these areas, um, intertidal and subtidal, where we have um, really high coralline and seaweed coverage in general and the pristine um, going to almost no surviving um, habitat forming seaweeds um, at the Waipapa site. And so it's, we hope that these, this information will be useful for spatially managing um, the impacts of the Kaikoura coast, um, particularly with regards to seaweed. Um, I think it's, it's pretty important to point out that Oaro Reef is one of the real refuges left to a lot of these species and um, potentially warrants a, a level of protection to um, impacts like trampling um, that may enable recovery of, of adjacent areas. Um, so um, that's all for me. Um, before I hand over to questions, I'd just like to thank the, the huge amount of people that have been involved in this project and um, colleagues here at NIWA, um, as well as the University of Canterbury that have really made this project possible, um, as well as um, funding agencies and related um, organisations that have helped um, sort of lead the path or um, clear the path to be able to do this. So um, thank you very much for listening. and I can relay it to Lee, or uh, if you have um, a microphone, um, I can unmute you so you can ask the question in person. So perhaps we can start with a question from the room. Does anyone have a question? Uh, Dave, Jill? Go ahead. I think you picked up. So these mics are all on, so. Uh, thanks very much for that very clear presentation, Lee. Of course, I have a million questions, but in particular, I'm interested in the progress of technology and the limits of technology. And I think that last slide of yours sort of encapsulated it. In the Paleozoic of the mid 1990s, we did some of this work with aerial, uh, uh, with planes, with Rob Murdoch and Dick Singleton, and we tried processing images with the technology available at the time. And there's two things that really impede. Uh, impeded sort of understanding diversity you know of those reefs one was that on sunny days which would you would think was the best time to go at those there was a huge amount of reflectance from water sitting on things and also a lot of shadowing and so if you go in your eye could sort of pick up where the big borders were but every program we used was really difficult so i assume you have some sort of averaging across that and then the second thing is that even if you do that, most of the diversity is actually below the canopies of some of those big species. So there's, in terms of biodiversity monitoring, you're, you're always going to have a problem. So one was we couldn't get, capture the big stuff readily. And the second thing is that a lot of it was missing anyhow. So I wish, I wonder if you could comment on that with these new technologies. Sure. Um, so the, the first part of that um, was the issue of glare um, and how we, we get around that. Um, and the second part was essentially biodiversity that we can't see for those uh, in case that wasn't clear to people viewing online. Um, so the issue with GLIA, um, largely the way we get around that is attempting to fly early morning if we can. So we're really looking for low tides that occur before lunchtime. Um, so aligning multiple threads of, of weather conditions, tide conditions, wave conditions is a real challenge and, and then trying to make sure that that's only ever captured at the early part of the day is another challenge. So there's a real limitation to when this kind of work can be done, but getting that 
that angle of capture, um, angle of the incident, um, angle of the sun is really critical to minimising that surface glare. Um, the effect of shadowing in boulders is, is something that I haven't been able to get around. It's, you can see sites that we had that are very flat platforms, easy. Sites where we've got big boulders is where it becomes challenging, for sure. Um, the second part about the overall biodiversity um, kind of really drives home the, the reason why we need validation sampling and why we need to also do this um, in situ as well. So um, without that level of um, fine scale sampling, we can't you know, reliably say what we're seeing at the large scale. So all of these surveys have been done with in situ um, validation and a few of those images you would have seen transects running through the middle of them. And so they've been photographed at the ground level to try and get a hold of that. But um, the other point that I'd make is that um, in, in the case of habitat forming seaweeds, we know that they really drive the biodiversity of these ecosystems. And while, while we can't fully um, inventory the whole seaweed biodiversity, we can essentially use them as a, as a health metric of the ecosystem as a whole. Um, we have some questions uh, through the Zoom chat. Uh, first one from Brian Abbey, who asks, you've mentioned that the costs are high for the drone study. How do they, what are they in relation to um, planes which require licenses, fuel and maintenance? So how do they compare? Yeah, so that's a, a good question, but it's, I've refrained from putting dollar values on things because there's too many factors to take into account, really. Um, you need to do this and there's too many applications as well so if for the aerial work we're really looking at mono specific stands so we're concerned with one species and that's uh, generally the surface canopy forming macrocystis giant kelp and so we can kind of get away with that high elevation um, because it's it, the, the canopy reaches the surface and we get a very strong spectral signal um, that we can differentiate from water um, but in the same aspect, we're interested over very big areas, you know, multiple kilometres. Um, and once you start talking about those sort of areas with drones, then you start, you start to have to plan across multiple days, um, driving to and from sites, and it becomes, you know, the, the time expense of people on the ground doing that is, can be really, um, it shouldn't be ignored. Um, but if you can get that done in a single day by a, a manned aircraft, then the savings are, are potentially really worthwhile. So um, I, would, I would expect that you could spend $10,000 or so, depending on, on, on what you're looking for using drones over a large area, um, whereas you're likely to spend less than that on a, an aerial plane. But that's, that's a really a rough estimate, but it, the the exact application um, and what you're hoping to get from it is real critical to um, choosing your method. Uh, thanks, Lee. And the next question from Leslie Bolton Ritchie is, uh, do you need to account for seasonal differences in macro algae presence and abundance? That is, if using this technology for monitoring, should you limit um, your work to the same time of year? Yes. Um, there's I think there's a bit of both ways on that. If, if you're interested in certain suites of species, then you might have to be very specific about your targeting. Um, if you're interested in some of the intertidal bloom forming species or the harvested species like uh, pyropia, then time of year is going to be really vital. Or if you're interested in mapping um, incursions of Undaria, time of year is also going to be really critical. Um, I would suggest that for general monitoring purposes. Um, I think given what we've seen over recent years with heat wave events that end of summer is probably the ideal time to look at things. It's often when we get the calmest conditions, um, the clearest water, but also when we might be expecting to see the, min the, the greatest minimum of some of these habitat forming species. Um, so time of year should be taken to, into account depending on the application, but consistency um, for monitoring through time um, is clearly going to be vital. 
Fantastic. Any more questions from the room? It just leads me to, um, uh, on behalf of Sustainable Seas, uh, thank Lee for a fascinating presentation and just amazing a view of um, Kaikoura from the air. If you'd like to find out more about Lee's project, have a look at the Sustainable Seas website. There are a, a link, there's a link there to a story map that um, Lee has created that shows you some of these amazing images. Um, this is, uh, there, um, if you'd like to find out more about upcoming webinars, just sign up to our uh, Sustainable Cities newsletter online. Uh, thank you very much.